Hey there, Tim Irwin here at Seeker City Hot Rods. Um, been a while, apologize for that. Been busy retiring and finishing up a race car of my own. All kinds of odds and ends. I thought I'd give you a little bit of update here at the shop, what's going on, and talk a little bit about rear suspension in a gasser. How I do it, it's not how everybody does it, but it's how I do it, it seems to work pretty good. So let me give you a tour around the shop and then we'll talk about rear suspensions. Right now, this is Henry J number one. We put Henry, Henry J number two together and made it roll just to get all the parts and pieces out of the way because we're building two identical cars with the exception of the drivetrain. And um, I wanted to build these things together. So if I bent one roll cage, I bent, bent two roll cages. And we had a pile of parts here, so I thought, well, let's make one roll and get it out of the way. And put number one back on the jig and we're just getting ready to start we're going to put the rear suspension in that I'll share more of that see the ladder bars laying there um, over here's a 55 Chevy I bought it's 36,000 original miles and it's been a race car most of its life so it's pretty rough on the inside the car itself is nice but the floors have been hacked and patched and bunch of you know nine million seat holes drilled in it so I redid the rear suspension you can barely see that and now I'm getting ready to put floors in it um, back in the back I got besides that I got a new Eastward plasma cutter and an arc droid which is really cool it's a CNC plasma cutter back here big grads hibernating She's parked for the winter time, so I gotta change the oil and unlash the valves in her, but she's in a resting place for the winter. But here's what we want to talk about. I shared some of the videos of this car in the beginning, and like I say, I apologize for not being on it, but life has gotten in the way. Now that I'm retired, hopefully I can start sharing videos on a weekly basis. Motors mounted. Front suspension's finished, radiator. If you look inside, we got the steering in, the pedals are all in, all that stuff's done, and I'm gonna talk about all that stuff, but I'm not doing it in this video. What I wanna talk about here is rear suspension. If you can see this, we've got everything mounted, the ladder bars are done, the mounts are done. Um, that right there, if you can see that, is the lower spring mount. In my cars, they typically use a coil spring for a couple reasons. I've built, I've built a few leaf spring cars in my lifetime and I've never been happy with the way they turned out because calculating spring ratio has been a bear for me. So I've found that using a coil spring is a lot better. From my previous video, I hope you remember I talked about how to find approximate instant center line, which is basically a string from the bottom of the tire up to the front bumper. And you want that ladder bar point down there to intersect with that line, the middle adjustment. Typically on most of these cars, something I didn't explain before is if you try to make the bottom bar level as you can, it's a pretty good starting point with a level bottom bar. These are chassis engineering bars, great set of ladder bars. Um, they bought out a speed shop in Kentucky and this was part of what they had. And remember this car here, all the parts and pieces I've used in it were in the previous car. So I'm trying to save them some money by reusing like the rear end housing and as you can see the drive shaft loop, stuff like that. Okay. So here's what we're looking for. We set the rear end up in the jig, as I told you before. I set them at a, a two degree upward angle, which actually would be down in, down in drive line terms because you're looking, when, you, when you're looking at a drive train and they talk about drive shaft and angles and engine angles and everything else, they, what they're talking about is the direction that the power is traveling, which is towards the rear end. So if you look at this thing you'd think the pinion is pointing up but that in theory 
or in all practicality that is a downward angle because the direction of travel of the power the pinion is pointing down in the back so that gets super confusing with a lot of people it was for me for a long time and I'm supposed to be smart enough to figure this stuff out obviously there's times I'm not that's you know I'm not a blonde but I guess that was the blonde part coming out of me once I got that it's pretty good so anyways I pointed up at a two degree angle okay the reason why I do that is typically my engines are pointing down at a two to three degree angle as well the reason why I do that is something GM did they put a lot of stuff in at a three degree angle and the reason why they did that is to get the um, transmission tunnel smaller in the car sounds crazy but that's why um, these things as you well know the engines are usually pretty high to clear all the steering and everything in them and what you're looking for when the car's making power you're looking for the pinion angle and the engine angle to be the same you would like to have those two lines parallel under power you know so when the rear end twists up in the car you know adds power it everything twists a tiny bit it's going to go to three degrees or close to three degrees that being said another reason why I do that is that you're looking for less than four degrees of u-joint angle under power the reason being any more than four degrees you start losing horsepower big time any more than four you lose horsepower so you're trying to keep the the plane of the engine in the plane of the pinion the same angle and minimize u-joint angle so by adding the angle I can raise the engine up higher in the car and still maintain my less than four degrees of u-joint angle I think in this I got like a degree and a half which works out great it's what you have to do you start rolling too much u-joint angle in the car and you're gonna start spitting out u-joints and you're gonna have all kinds of weird vibrations and stuff like that so that's why I do what I do this thing has a drive shaft in it by the way because this is what was in the car originally this drive shaft so I tried to put the motor back where it was which a lot of classes like it you know the number one spark plug lined up with the spindle center line so this thing's away from the firewall always but that's why I did it so using parts over I didn't use the pedals master cylinder etc but we're talking about rear end so let's get back to that okay I keep the suspension mounting points as wide as I can the wider the mounting points are the more stable the car is going to be if I had put the ladder bars underneath the the front frame rails I'd have moved they'd have been moved in another you know six inches plus on each side towards the center of the car and will make the car unstable like I say the farther out your suspension mounting points are that being ladder bars and shocks and stuff like that the more stable the car will be as you'll notice I put the spring mounts I made it so the springs are a half inch away from the frame rail it's hard to see with no springs in there and I might show that a little bit later on but the farther out you keep them the better off you are in the same way with the wheelie bar mounts I'm gonna walk around back and show you that the wheelie bars aren't on it but I want to show you the wheelie bar mounts here on the housing you can see them the far out as I could get them so that when it's on the wheelie bars it's more stable it's easier to adjust the car because you use the wheelie bars to adjust the car these long bars I have here they're basically just strut rods that go in place of the shocks this car had um, competition engineering um, three-way adjustable shocks on it and I reuse those I typically won't use those on the back of a drag car I, I love using AFCO products have for a long long time they're my go-to shock I typically will use them and, and like this type of vehicle 
they don't want a coil over on it. I mean, if you're just running fun, having a good time, use a coil over. I'll talk about them later on. But this is basically like a Sega car here, Southeast Gasters Association. How they build them, they do do not want the shock and the coil spring together. They want it separate. So that is why I did this. This car was a Sega car, and I'm building it so if these guys want to do that again, they can. With the power they're putting in it right now, they won't be able to, but needless to say that's why I have these long struts on here that rip through use the shocks over something else I want you to notice is my coil spring mount is in front of the rear end housing a lot of guys will put them on top a lot of guys will put them behind you do what you want to do but what I've noticed in building these type of cars that if you move your spring mount forwards it allows the car to, to rotate better because you're moving this, the, um, that pivot point closer to the middle of the car. As I said earlier, the farther out you get your chassis mounts, the more stable the car is. Same way the spring. If you move the spring back here behind the rear end housing, um, it'd make the car more stable, but it wouldn't transfer as well because there's no rear weight on this car. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, um, how to figure that. but. Um, that's why I do what I do with the spring mounts. I use parts, the the cup, upper cup I make myself, the bottom, that bottom bracket I make myself. I'll show you that a little closer. Maybe it's a little bit of an overkill, but it's a piece that welds onto the housing on the bottom and it gets an adjustable spring jack. This piece right here threads into that and we can adjust our ride height with this piece here you can see a bunch I typically cut them down I buy them like this because it's got a hex in it you can put a ratchet in it's a circle track part from Speedway Motors this little adjustable bung is a part from Speedway Motors it's my opinion it's simpler to buy them than to make them so here we go I use that I move it in front of the rear end housing so that my pivot it's more towards the middle of the car, my spring pivot. Um, allows the car to transfer a little bit better. Gotta remember, we're using little motors. You know, a lot of these things are 300 cubic inches in sea gas. This was a B car, so it would have been 8 pounds per cubic inch, so it could have been like a 383 maybe. This is a 383 that's in here, but it's just a, you know, just a, probably a, I think it's, they said it made 500 horse, which for, Sega nowadays, that's nowhere near enough, but this guy's never driven a car like this before, so it'll be a good starter. Anyways, we're talking about coil springs. One thing you got to remember about springs is it takes a certain amount of pressure or weight to compress a spring, and everything usually, like their numbers on springs, are figured in pound increments per inch. See, this is a 150 pound spring, okay? It takes 150 pounds of weight to compress the spring one inch. Um, I buy these, these are AFCOs. I buy these from AFCO. They are extremely cheap, like 64 bucks a piece, so you really can't go wrong there. If you miss your guess, you can order another set of springs for 64 bucks each and throw them in there and you know if you've got too heavy a spring or too light a spring just throw it in there it takes you 15 minutes this is a simple deal another reason why I like these it adds more adjustability to the car a lot of guys will put solid spring mounts in it and to me that's not the way to fly adjustability in a race car is something that you have to have I've got a buddy of mine that runs a car in our group that's got a um, no adjustment points for his ladder bars or nothing he built it as a street car car works good but it's just because he's putting so much power in it if he had a small block motor in it with a single four barrel probably wouldn't work as well but it's got a blown small block anyways I'm rambling I'm going to talk about this spring guys are afraid to use them because they don't know how to calculate the height it's real simple you can take a car like this, you say you got a B gas car, okay? And it needs, because of the engine size, it needs to weigh 2,500 pounds, okay? 
So what you do, and this is approximation now because I know it's going to weigh different, but this is a, a simple way to figure this out. It's not rocket science. So you take 2,500 and divide it by four because you got four corners on the car, okay? That ends up being 625 pounds per corner, okay? So if you divide 120. 150 into 625 you get 4.16 inches of compression or four let's just call it four and eight okay that's that spring there will compress four and eight inches in the car so when we go from 13 13 inches tall and we take four and eight off we're going to be eight and seven eighths tall when we're done so basically what I do is I'll screw this thing up here out of my perch about an inch and a half okay I screw that up out of that mount right there and it, it sticks up an inch and a half and then what I do is I've got a piece of four and a half inch tubing that is cut four and an eighth inches long cars on the jig setting it at actual ride height I'll set that tube on top of that plate uh, let me grab one I'll show it to you how, I, how I've done this to make it work and I got this from a buddy of mine, Zach Call. I seen him doing it with a piece of PVC, and I, man, that's easier than the way I've been doing it. And like I said, I don't want to take credit for how this is done, but I just refined it a tiny bit. I come back over here in my junk bin. I've got that piece of tubing right there. It's five inch tubing, but it's got a little washer welded in that sort of keeps it centered on this whole deal is here that goes in that mount and then I build my upper mount off the top of that pretty simple I set that plate on it and then I put that cross member in I've got those two two vertical pieces that weld into the roll cage that support it I mean it's that simple the nice part like I say when you're done you can raise and lower that adjustment to get the right height that you want in the back of the car and basically what I'm doing when I'm doing that is looking at my ladder bar bottom angle. That's important. You know, you, where that suspension point is and your instant center is super important. So that's what you're looking for, adjusting all this stuff. But that's how I figure springs. Like I say, if you put it together and you missed on your weight a little bit and you think the back end of the car is a little high, you can either raise or lower the spring seat or you can just get a lighter spring and put it in the same way if it's you know smashing a spring too much you gotta get 175 pound spring it'll help you but that's that's how you calculate spring height another thing I want to show you in rear suspension is my pannard rod okay I'm hoping you can see this I use their original bracket so I still have to gusset that because that'll break off there'll be a triangular gusset that goes down to the housing towards the middle when I'm all done but one of the things you want to do when you're building these is try to keep that pannard rod at ride height parallel with the ground and or let's call this half travel okay like total travel of suspension everything's sort of built at the halfway point so when that swings through an arc it's not pulling the rear end of the um, left in the car real hard or pushing it real hard you want that parallel with the ground and or the rear end housing as close as you can get it you'll notice this one's a little high off the housing but I've got a lot of suspension travel in this car because of the shocks I use so I tried to keep it up a little more than normal usually I'd keep it probably two inches lower than that to the housing because most of the shocks we use are five inch stroke but these things here I think are nine or ten so that being said, I'm going to cut this one off here, I think. I've given you a little bit of tips on rear suspension. You know, mounts out as far as you can get them to the outside of the car to make the car more stable. Springs and shocks and everything else, ladder bar mounts, as far as you can get them out. Frame rails, I typically, when you're building the car, you see that like you can see between the tire and everything I usually try to keep about two inches of clearance that gives me options on tire widths and stuff so this car had the frame rails real narrow in, in the beginning and 
you know, didn't work, the car didn't work well. So we're hoping that we solve all these problems. If any of you have seen Jumpin' Jack Flash, this car's built basically the same, so it should do the same thing. But anyways, later on I'm going to talk about pedal installation, how I did my motor mounts, trans mounts, stuff like that. All that, as you can tell, this baby rolls. Still got a ways to go. I got a bunch of sheet metal work to do, but we're getting closer. Well, thanks for watching this video. I'll try to get one up next week, too. We'll talk about the next step on what's probably going on in the Henry J. As you know, we can get some better videos of this stuff, do it pieces at a time. So keep watching. Thanks for watching.